Getting a protein is a bit like having the whole solar system full of blind people, each with a Rubik's Cube, and they all arrive at the solution at the same time. That illustration is painting such a clear picture of the impossibility of this happening. Modern science has revealed a world inside the simplest living cell which doesn't add up for it being made in some sort of chemical soup. The origin of life is a huge problem for those who insist that it's come about through purely natural processes. Don, you have a PhD in biology. You've had a career in experimental biology. You understand what it takes for life to exist. So why do you think many people today will claim that the origin of life is actually not a part of the evolution story? Well, it's only recently that popularizers of evolution have actually tried to get rid of the origin of life out of their story. I think the simple reason they want to do that is because modern science has revealed a world inside the simplest living cell which just doesn't add up for it being made in some sort of chemical soup by natural processes, you know, by some chance process. And the question of the origin of life has become so difficult that they want to put it aside. That's what's happened. And so we're going to look at today why it's become such a problem and, and what the things are that are intractable, un, unsolvable. There are things which are just unsolvable for the idea of what they call chemical evolution, that chemicals became life. And so that's what we're, we're going to look at that. Okay. So first of all, can you tell me what, what's needed then for the origin of life? Well, we've got to get the right building blocks for a start. So if you're going to make a banana cake, you need bananas and flour for a start. And what are the bananas and flour for a living thing? What are the ingredients that are necessary to even get started? Well, you need amino acids. They're very important because they're the building blocks of proteins and life's made of proteins. Uh, for example, humans make possibly as many as a million different proteins and they're what make our hair our skin, our eyes, they hold our bones together, all sorts of things. And the enzymes that you're making to digest the food you recently ate, they're, they're types of proteins, and they're all built from amino acids. And you've got 20 different amino acids that make proteins, and they're strung together in specific order to make all the different sorts of proteins. So the order of them is very important, but you need the right amino acids to start with. And here's the problem, first problem for their story is that when you have a chemical soup to make amino acids, and you can make them some of them that way at least, you get both right and left-handed forms. And so that doesn't help make proteins, and we'll go into that further. But um, the next thing you need in this uh, soup, you need sugars. And sugars, we know sucrose and fructose and glu glucose, but life has made a lot of different sugars. And one particularly important one is ribose. Ribose is the backbone of DNA and RNA. And ribose is unstable, so it's very difficult to actually make in some sort of chemical soup. So that, there's a problem. But the other, other things we need are things like RNA and DNA, the building blocks of those, which are called nucleic acids. So there's four different ones that go into DNA and there's a, one different one that goes into RNA. So there's four in RNA as well, but one of them is different, called a uracil. Uh, and uracil is particularly difficult to make too. So that's another problem because it's unstable, like ribose is unstable. Then you've got lipids, otherwise known as fats, and these are essential for membranes. So the thing that wraps up the cell and holds it together uh, is made of lipids or fats. Uh, so, and you, you can't make a cell membrane or wall just out of fat because if you've got a fatty layer like that, it just seals everything in or seals everything out. But you need a cell wall which is going to get things in and out. So that doesn't sort of make for a cell. So they're just the basic ingredients before you even get started, but a lot more is needed other than that. And these are basic ingredients that are needed just in one simple cell, let alone all the yeah, cells yeah, of our body. That's right. Every cell in the body needs those basic ingredients. 
Yeah, that's a lot of ingredients <laughs> already. Well, we haven't even got started yet and what's needed. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the ingredients that we need, but is there a problem with getting them all together to oh, do what they need to do? Oh, indeed there is. Um, yeah, one major problem is that the conditions in it that can make amino acids, so you get the right conditions to make amino acids, they're the wrong conditions to make sugars. So if you've got nitrogen present, for example, you need that for amino acids, but if you've got nitrogen present, the sugars won't form. So how do they work together? Well, you can't. So, so they do these experiments and get sugars on the one hand. So, oh, there, I've got sugars and amino acids. Yeah, but you can't get them in the same soup. Mm. <laughs> so you can't get them together. So there's a problem. And also, also metallic ions are necessary for life, like things like magnesium and calcium, for example. Calcium is very important in bones and humans, but they're important in all living things, calcium and magnesium. If you've got calcium and magnesium present and you've got lipids form, the lipids react there and form soap scum. So you think about it when you wash in hard water with soap, soap's just a, a, a salt of fat, um, and it forms a scum. And that's what happens when you've got lipids and these ions. So you, you can't, again, you can't get the things together that need to be together to form the first life. Mm, so this chemical soup is not going to be able to, it's going to have ingredients, but they're not going to work together the way that they need that, to. That's right. It, it, to, to get to craft a soup which makes one thing, can't make the other. Yeah. That, that's the problem. And so, and, and fats, for example, are high energy. I mean, people know that if you eat fat, eat one gram of fat, you're getting two and a quarter times as much energy to get one gram of protein or one gram of, of uh, carbohydrate. So fats are high energy. And they're a problem because high energy things are, are more unstable. So you can't, that's much harder to make them. And, and then the biggest problem, I think, above all those things is what's called chirality. You think, well, what on earth is that? That sounds like a big word. But chirality is like handedness. So if you look, hold your right hand up to the mirror, you'll see a left hand looking back at yes. you. Yes. And that's chirality. And so three-dimensional chemicals, like most of the amino acids and sugars and things, uh, come in th right and left-handed forms. They're mirror images of one another. And mm. life only is based on one form. With amino acids, it's a left-handed form. And with the sugars, it's a right-handed form. So if you've got a mixture of left and right-handed amino acids, you can never get a functional protein. Because that's the mixture you'd have in a chemical soup? That's right. A chemical right. soup would only produce left and right-handed forms. Uh -huh. It won't produce the pure left-handed forms, which are needed for proteins, and it won't produce the pure right-handed sugars that are needed for polysaccharides, things like starch and glycogen and so on, and many other things that, that are made from sugars. Mm, it's DNA. It's or DNA or ribose with the DNA and RNA, for example. So... Uh, so these, because they're three-dimensional, it, it's a huge problem because you can't get life out of this sort of soup where you've got a mixture of the two. So you can't get a functional protein. So these stories about, you know, having sparks flying through things and forming these chemicals as if that's got something to do with the origin of life are quite misleading. They're quite misleading because you don't get the right left-handed amino acids you don't get the right, correct right-handed sugars and things out of those sort of experiments. Mm. And they seem to be able to spin some of the stories about these um, processes in a way that sounds convincing. Yeah, and so students reading the textbook and uh, whatever, they think, oh, they've almost got life. It's just so far from the truth. It, it's sounding impossible. <laughs> the, the probability of this actually being able to happen by chance. Is there um, a way to calculate that probability? Well, I think we actually need to deal with something else which is even more important than what we've just talked about, and that is the information in living things. Because mm. this is another takes it to another level. So you got see living things aren't just a mixture of, of bits like a cake. You can't just throw all these bits together. Oh, you got life. That, that's what they thought at Darwin's time. You know, this life's pretty simple. Just a, um, you know, a ball of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's what he thought of the cell. Didn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah, yeah. It was sort of a bit of protoplasm or something, and it was all it seemed all very simple. But today we know that's not the case. And living things are a chock block full of information, an information encoding system. And here's the thing: you need both the encoding system 
which is the nucleic acid bases. We, we might call them chemical letters on the DNA. There's four of them. You take three at a time, and that makes up what they call a codon, and each codon specifies an amino acid, the 20 different amino acids. So in other words, for um, a uh, protein of 100 amino acids, you would need 300 of the codons, 300 yes. of the chemical letters, I mean, because there's three for each amino acid. So, so the coding system is just amazing. And there's nothing about the code which chemistry could create it because it, there's no chemical relationship between the code and the amino acid it codes for. It's like if you look at the letters in the English alphabet, A, B, C, D, yep. and look at A, you say, well, looking at the A doesn't tell you how you should say it. It's just a, it's an yeah. arbitrary association with the sound. You just learn it and you learn when you learn English. Um, if you only ever saw Chinese, you wouldn't have a clue what A in English meant. And so with the coding system, there's nothing about the code which relates it to the chemistry of the amino acids. It's an it's a, it's a arbitrary code. But it's not actually arbitrary. When you look at the codes, and people have studied this, it's an optimum code. So it's optimum code to avoid errors in the reading system and in the production of the proteins. So, and this this baffles people. How could an optimal? Um, how did any code arise by any natural process for yes. a start without intelligence? And then how could it be optimized by chance? Mm. So the, these are fundamental problems. And so we've got the code, but you've also got the information written with the code. So this is another level again. Is this a bit of that? chicken and egg problem as well? Well, yeah. I mean, there's no point having the code unless you're using it to write information and you've got all these specifications written on the DNA um, based on the code. So if you look at a human, we've got 3,000 million chemical letters on our DNA coding for all the things that make us human and that information. So how much information in the simplest thing that can live? Well, scientists have done work on, say, um, things like um, a mycoplasma uh, a microbe, and that's pretty simple in this mm -hmm. compared to a human. And, well, it's got over 400 proteins or 400 genes, and they sort of chopped out some of the genes, see if we can get rid of some of them, and it still works. Well, they, you can't take out very much. And what they found in the end was that the simplest microbe that can live, you're talking about over 400 proteins, so this is over 400 genes on the DNA. So not only have you got to get the genes on the DNA, but you've got to get the re reading system, which can actually read the DNA, translate the information into proteins and make a cell. In fact, you need all the paraphernalia to do that with the DNA at the same time for it to actually start making proteins. So it's no good just having the DNA code. You, you wouldn't be able to read it. It's no good having the, the reading system unless you've got all the DNA information there to read to make more proteins, make more cells and things. So the simplest living thing is phenomenally complex. And we're talking about some of the uh, machinery inside this little tiny bacterium, which you need a microscope to see. Um, there are uh, machines that unwind the DNA. So it's, it un unwinds the DNA so it can be read because the double helix has to be unwound. Mm -hmm. And so that it actually unwinds it and then it reads the DNA and there's machines that read the DNA and there's other ones that's actually twisted back again and the ones that copy it and they run along the thing copying it and, and, and they're copying it to messenger RNA to make the, the information for making proteins. And, and there's just machinery, machine after machine after machine all have to work together for life to exist. And what we've, what we've discovered inside living things just defies the idea that this sort of thing could come about by some sort of chemical soup idea. Mm. I wonder if Darwin was alive today and he was seeing the things that we know now, whether he would still believe in his theories. <laughs> Well, good question, and I wrote an article about that. <laughs> that. Would Darwin be a Darwinist today? He shouldn't be, because of what we know, but he was driven by his desire to get rid of God. Because mm. he's upset with God about the death of his daughter. And so, uh, so I think he'd still be a Darwinist in a sense, because many people today that study this stuff, they're Darwinists. Why are they in the light of what we've been talking about? They shouldn't be, but they, they want to get rid of God, basically.
Mm. So if we come back to this idea of what's the probability of this is how would we can we put a number on it? <laughs> well, it, it, life is so complex. Even that simplest bacterium is mm. so complex, you couldn't actually calculate a probability of life forming. But we don't have to do that. We can actually, we can calculate, using some assumptions, the probability of a protein forming, given that you've got the right uh, ingredients, all the 20 amino acids, the left-handed ones, and without all the right-handed ones, because that sort of halves the probability. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because if you've got 40 instead of 20, I mean, you've got to select just the 20. That means you, you've got 40 to choose from instead of 20. So let's make, it just, them. let's make it just 20. Yep. Let's make it a bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's just take a small protein, like 150 amino acids long, and what would be the probability of getting those 150 amino acids in the correct order? Mm. So what, how do you calculate that? Well, 1 over 20... Is, is choose the first one, choose the second one, one over 20, so mm. multiply them together, mm. and then you multiply that 150 times, one over 20 times, one over 20 times, one over 20, 150 times. So it's it's one in 10 to the power of 195 is the probability of it forming by chance. Wow. Right. And also we've assumed that these amino acids can string together without an enzyme, which, of course, we don't have yet, and that won't happen. And that's another problem with the story. <laughs> but so, so the probability of getting one small protein, just one, not 400, mm. just one, uh, is ten, one in 10 to the power of 195. And can anybody imagine that number? No, that's just way beyond. In fact, somebody they calculated that the universe has 10 to the power of 80 electrons. That's a number with 80 zeros. Mm. So this is a number with 195 zeros. <laughs> Um, and so there's a guy at MIT actually calculated, assuming the universe was as old as the Big Bang and all that sort of, sort of thing and how, many, how big the universe was and how many events could have happened in the universe in that time frame, you know, was every molecular vibration or something in that massive time and how many events would that be? 10 to the power of 120 is the maximum number of events in the universe given its evolutionary assumptions about its age and everything. When you say events, just events. explain what you mean. Well, that just means something can happen. Not necessarily a full experiment with all the amino acids and everything, but just the number of events, number of things that actually tick, tick, or whatever, you know, anything. 100, 10 to the power of 120. So we've got 10 to the power of 195 for this one protein. In other words, it would never happen. So... Um, Fred Hoyle was a British astronomer and mathematician, and he did a lot of thinking about the uh, origin of life and the probability of the origin of life. He, he did a lot of calculations, and he, he used an analogy to try and help people understand the problem. And he said, getting a protein, just a simple protein, mm -hmm. is a bit like having the whole solar system full of blind people, each with a Rubik, Rubik's Cube, and they're all fiddling with it. They're all blind. They can't see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're all fiddling with it. And they all arrive at the solution at the same time. And he said, that's the probability. I'll give you some idea of the probability of getting a, a protein by natural processes. One protein. Yeah. So then he went on to say, because he didn't believe in God. So he said, oh, well, life must have come from outer space because it didn't happen on Earth. But then when he did these calculations, um, he came to the conclusion that, life couldn't have formed anywhere in the universe. And, and he came to the conclusion it must have been intelligently designed. Oh, that's a bit radical. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that illustration is painting such a clear picture of the impossibility of this happening by yeah. chance. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. So that's what that calculation shows because we're only, we only talked about one protein, exactly. not 400 and so on. If you start calculating for hundreds, it's just, it just becomes quite ridiculous. So if life didn't come about by chance, how did it come about? Well, this is one of the most certain discoveries of modern science is that life did not come about by chance. So what, how did it come about? It had to involve intelligent design. Information and information coding systems never arise from chemistry. They only arise from intelligence. And so what intelligence could be responsible for life? 
the intelligence that, that created life is far above our intelligence. No scientist could ever dream of creating even one functional protein, let alone life. I mean, scientists are very clever at discovering life and discovering what proteins do and their structure and, and all this has been a marvellous discoveries that have done, but they could never, ever have from scratch before actually studying it dreamt of creating life or creating even a protein that functions. So we're talking about an intelligence far above all the brightest scientists in the world, far above their intelligence that created life. And even to me, that seems so clear with the, the evidence in the picture that you've painted, but yet we still have many brilliant minds. Trying to prove that it could happen by nat naturally. Uh, so It seems strange. <laughs> well, it's, it's about getting rid of God, see. The, the, old, the, con the, conclu the only conclusion we can come to is this super intelligence. Mm. Who's that? Sounds awfully like God as revealed in the Bible the creator God of the universe, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and whose intelligence would be far above us. And so um, that's an un unpopular conclusion. Mm, why, why do you think it's so unpopular? Well, if God made us, he owns us, and we're responsible to him for our lives. That's what it's about. Mm, and we don't want to be responsible. And we don't want to be responsible. There's nothing new about this. This goes back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Mm. <laughs> they basically they don't want to do their own thing. So why the God of the Bible then? Yeah, good question. I don't know of any other viable candidate. Uh, what other, what else do we know about that could be responsible? There's only the creator God of the Bible. And the Bible reveals God as one who made us in his image. And that humans, not, not anything else. So why did he make us in his image? Because he wanted to love us and us to have a relationship with him. Not that he needs us but that he wanted to love us. So he created us in his image for a relationship with him. So that's why we exist, for a relationship with God. And uh, the whole Bible is about God reaching out to us uh, for that relationship, for the, to love us. And uh, he provided a way that we can actually know him and have fellowship with him. Mm. So there's a, a bit of a... I hear a bit of a call to respond there. How, how could we respond to that? Well, the Bible says if we seek God with all our heart, we'll find him. And so I, I encourage people to seek God mm. and you'll find him. Thank you so much for this amazing journey that you've taken us on. You've written several articles about this as well, Don. Where would we find those? Well, creation.com, there's a major article called Origin of Life. Quite simple. Uh, it's quite a long article, but it's explained in terms that most people can understand. And we've got lots of other articles at more technical level, but the Origin of Life one is comprehensive. And the things we've been, just been talking about, uh, you can read about them there. Thanks so much, Don. That's been incredibly helpful. Thanks, Jess.